Welcome to episode 130 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to let you listen in on a roundtable discussion with a diverse group of teachers who are sharing their best hacks, tips, and tricks for digital organization and saving time with technology. Visit truthforteachers.com to see a bullet point outline of all the key concepts we discuss, and you can leave your own ideas or questions there in the comments. So back in episode 121 about streamlining grading and assessment, I introduced you to a new format that I'm trying for the podcast. I've always thought that it would be really cool to get a group of master teachers together to hash out some of their toughest challenges and also to share what's working for them. So I've gathered a group of educators to create a productivity roundtable. Joining me are five members of the 40-Hour Teacher Workweek Club's graduate program. So these are teachers who have completed the full year of the club, and they're now in year two or three of taking those results to the next level and really continuing to streamline every aspect of their teaching and their life. So they have done a tremendous amount of work in experimenting with various productivity strategies, um, both in their classrooms and just creating systems and routines that work well for them. So they all teach at different grade levels and different subject areas. And I think that will help you hear what works with a variety of teaching contexts and a variety of different teaching styles. So this time around, the roundtable discussion topic is about how to use technology to actually save time instead of letting it create more work for you. During the roundtable, we're discussing how to keep track of and how to organize all the teaching ideas and resources you find online. We're also talking about email management and streamlining digital communication. And then at the end, they'll share their favorite tech tools for saving time as a teacher and the tools that they help organize their non-teaching lives as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the first question that I wanted to ask you all is how you keep track of and organize the teaching ideas and resources that you find online. Hi, I'm Osa, and I teach first grade in New York City. Um, I try to keep it simple. I use Pinterest to save um, ideas that I find on teacher blogs um, or uh, websites, and I've created boards uh, for specific skills, uh, so I don't have to waste time searching for resources when I do look through what I have saved. Um, and then materials that I know that I'll use in the ne- in the near future, um, I download them and save to my Google Drive, um, which is where I save all of my digital resources that I've used. Um, and that's organized under subject and skill or um, age or grade level, uh, if necessary. Um, and I think I found that as long as I keep my, my Google Drive organized, um, then I can find my resources quickly. Um, and of course, naming them in a way that I'll remember was also essential to, to finding what I need. My name is Desiree and I teach fourth grade in California. Um, I don't really keep any hard copies of anything. I try to save everything in my Google Drive. And um, my folders are mostly organized by subject and then within the subject by uh, standard. So main idea, summary, whatever the case may be. And then I have some folders that are organized by our units and our curriculum. If I've created some GLAD strategies or something of that sort. I do have a Pinterest that I occasionally use, usually only during the summertime when I'm looking for some new ideas. Um, And those boards are also organized by standard. And then I also have some bookmarks that um, of different websites that I like or want to check out. And those are all organized by subject. I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm a high school teacher in Maine. Um, and I, uh, we're required to have a course website uh, on Google websites as part of the school um, calendar and website. So what we do is basically break down each day what we're going to do so a parent can see where we're at. And if a kid misses uh, a day, they can just click on the link and see what we're doing. But it also organizes all my files for each of the units. So the links basically are there um, linked to the day. And if I don't want it to be public right away, I just change the share settings until it's ready to go public. And I'll also use link Google Slides in there for presentations. And within that, I'll have speaker notes for lesson or um, link for activity reminders. After that, I still do have a file cabinet, 
But inspired by Angela and one of her podcasts, I did really go to town this summer and basically purge several boxes of stuff so that I really just have the bare minimum. And then as I get to, um, say, an AP psychology, I'll have a group of folders for each chapter that I know I'm going to cover with only a paper master that I know I'm going to use. And then I'll make copies I need. And when that unit's done, the folder goes back. Um, and I just keep the bulk of my student work on Google Classroom also, unless it's art. And even then, I'm getting to the point where I'm scanning more and more. So I'm really, really, really trying to be much more ruthless about the stuff that I keep. Hi, I'm Erin Palazzo. Uh, I teach high school English in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, and I'd have to say that this is probably one of the biggest changes I've made. Um, our school transitioned to one-to-one -one with iPad use just around the same time that I joined the 40-hour Teacher Workweek Club. Um, I've slowly but surely purged about 90% of the paper copies I was keeping, and then I also went through and I sorted, purged, and organized all my digital information. Um, they used to be on folders on my school laptop, and then there was always a concern concern if the laptop crashes, I'll lose all my uh, materials. So I moved everything into Google Drive folders. And at some point in the year, someone in the club shared this great tip uh, about how to maximize Google Drive. So I started adding numbers to the beginning of folders so that the folders would appear in the order I wanted to and not just the default alphabetical order. And I also changed the folder colors so that uh, similar folder topics were the same color. So now it's super easy for me to skim through my layers of folders, find exactly what I need. As an English teacher, I'm constantly collecting exemplars of writing to use as models for the next year. Um, or as part of a reteaching or a mini lesson in the near future. Um, that work I collect in Notability, which is one of my favorite apps. Our school does pay for that. Um, so I have that on my iPad. Um, and I also collect clean copies of any articles or other online material that I want students to annotate um, that could be graphs or infographics, especially in um, AP Lang, uh, where the students study visual rhetoric. Um, and I've got to say Notability is definitely my favorite app for combining text, highlighting, and handwritten notes in one place. And then I can take the PDFs from Notability and either push them out to my students or print them out if I need to. Um, aside from that, I really rely on Chrome's accessibility across devices to access bookmark sites and utilize extensions. My favorite one is Clean Save, which lets me clean up all the ads and photos and other junk around um, an article or a website that I want to print out um, or save a PDF of. I'm Nicole Guzman and I teach fifth grade in Provo, Utah. Um, for me, one of the things is that I don't print a resource and put it in my files unless it's something that I've already successfully used. Um, otherwise, it just ends up becoming clutter that I have to sort later. So instead, I take advantage of digital storage. Um, like others, I have my Google Drive organized by subject and subtopic. And I like to use the Kami extension. Um, and the Kami extension in Chrome lets you really easily add and organize files into your Google Drive, um, even PDFs. And so I'm, I take advantage of that to directly add things right into there. And I also um, just use the Chrome bookmarks and have those also organized by subject and um, then subtopics. Um, for me, Pinterest just overwhelms me. So um, if I save something to Pinterest, um, I don't like having to get back on there to find it because then I end up clicking through everything and it takes me a lot of time. So I prefer to just directly save it into my folders. And then when I'm planning, I can just see the options that I've saved um, and choose what I want to use, but they aren't cluttering up my actual physical files. So one of the tech tools that's supposed to save time, but can actually be more of a time suck is email. So I'm wondering if you all have any tips for managing email and your digital communication. So what I've noticed that um, a long time ago, which is what maybe about seven or eight years ago, when our um, cell phones used to be just flip phones and weren't these smartphones that we have now. It was a whole lot easier to ignore my emails. Um, so what I've done now that everyone has a, um, a smartphone is to just turn off my notifications um, and that way I don't have to jump every time there's a ping on my phone. Um, I also have a routine for checking my emails and I'm quite strict with that. 
unless there's a pressing matter. Um, I check emails first thing in the morning, most school days. And if I don't have time, then I'll do that right after school. But I've also, you know, I've trained my parents really well in using Blooms. They know that they can all, always reach me there. So if I see a Blooms notification on my phone, that's something that I'll check if I have time during the day. Um, and if I haven't received one, then yeah, when I have time, that's when I check my emails. Um, I also use um, an extension on Chrome or Gmail actually called Boomerang. And it's been really wonderful for helping me to, um, to organize my emails um, or to even schedule them. So I can schedule messages to be returned to my uh, Gmail inbox. Um, and I tend to do this with messages that I don't have to deal with right away. Um, it helps me get rid of clutter when there's so many new messages in my inbox, um, which tends to overwhelm me. Uh, I also use labels to cat categorize my messages in Gmail um, so that I can find them easily. Um, find a, a message about a particular teaching skill or about a particular student. And I think the best way that I found to save time on email is to never respond outside of work hours. Um, and I very, very strict with that in terms of responding to parents, um, unless it's an emergency. So I have quiet hours set on blooms and parents know that they won't receive a response from me after 6 p.m. on weekdays and not at all on weekends. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, communicating with colleagues, again, if it's not pressing, I'll use Boomerang to sort of, uh, type out my message and then schedule it to be sent out during the next, uh, work day. Um, I try to do email, um, at the beginning and the end of the day. Um, I just like to take a quick, uh, quick look in the morning to see if there's anything really pressing. And usually those things that are going to be really pressing are either a parent email or um, something that's got to be dealt with right away. Um, I am rather infamous amongst my coworkers for not responding to emails if I don't have to. <laughs> um, I tell them all I'm a people person. And so um, I find it much more efficient to walk down the hall and talk to people rather than starting a long email chain that usually can be handled in a two to five minute conversation. Um, and that, that I think is true for a lot of this stuff. Um, that being said, parent emails usually, uh, they get a pretty high priority with me. Um, and I also, my AP psychology students, if they're stuck on homework assignment or something, um, cause they tend to be a little bit more neurotic than others. Um, I will re respond to those if I happen to, um, see those towards the end of the day, or even if I'm home, but, um, uh, one of the things I couldn't do the whole Angela, Angela's uh, podcast where everything got archived right away. That was just too ruthless. But what I like doing is when I see a whole sheet of email or a page of email, I will click on the default button, which selects all of the emails to be trashed. And then I'll go through and I'll just click the ones that I want to keep. And it's just a mm -hmm. little mind shift um, where I basically say, do I really, really need to check this email? And if I don't, by the time I'm done, I've probably taken 40 emails and cut it down to 10 or 12. And then that makes it much more manageable. Um, and I also have a patented opener for situations where I haven't gotten back to somebody right away. And I just say, I apologize for my delayed response. And I just move on from that. But you really have to be ruthless about email because it just can take up so much of your time. I think uh, the a big shift that I made this year was to stop using the email app. Um, I have a MacBook Air at school, and um, I was using just that, that little app icon to open up my email, which meant the little red dot with all the number of emails waiting for me, um, and the pop-up notifications that always come up with some uh, probably <laughs> confidential uh, email uh, subject line while I have my screen projecting for the kids to see. Um, it just became too much of a hassle. Do I turn it on? Do I turn it off? And um, and I just was always like focused on that number. And I found myself uh, more and more getting pulled into, well, let me see who emailed and is it urgent or is it not? Um, 
And I didn't want it distracting me from what I was doing in the moment, which as we know, 80% of the time or more is I'm actively engaged with students. So now what I do is I check my email at key points throughout the day. I use, um, I open up, we have uh, Gmail accounts through our school accounts, um, which I open through Chrome rather than using that app. Um, and so I'm checking it. Um, like it sounds like most people do in the morning, uh, during my prep and after school, if there are immediate, immediate or urgent emails, then I'll address those, uh, immediately. And I try and batch the rest, whether it's, um, a scholarship application, a kid is filling out and needs a recommendation for, or a request from a colleague for something that I don't have to deal with immediately. I'll try and put that into when I plan out my week at the beginning of the week, I'll put that in that one prep period maybe twice a week um, will be to go through those emails. I do try and keep my inbox now as close to zero as possible. I'm a minimalist. I love the feeling of a zero inbox. Um, so I have a paper planner. Everything goes in that paper planner. So if we get an email from our administration about an assembly schedule or an important event, or I get an IEP meeting, um, all of that goes in my planner and those emails get deleted. And then I use the, the labels or the folders in Gmail to file things away. Um, and the two biggest ones that I found are that are helpful just as catch-alls. I have a staff folder um, for important staff information, like the phone directory that gets sent out every year um, or the lunch schedule for the semester. And then I have a student folder and that one I use for uh, personal information about IEPs, um, notes from the nurses about a student who's going to be out for uh, surgery or is going through some mental health issues, any parent communications I want to save. Um, so I know I can find all that in either the staff or the student folder. And then at the end of the summer, I'll go through those two folders and just purge out anything that was important to hang on to throughout the year last year, but I don't need to save for the future. Um, and then that way, my inbox, when I see it, really is just the few things that I really need to focus on. Uh, I also check my emails once a day. Um, I do it in the beginning of the day as part of my morning routine. And I do the same thing as what was mentioned as any dates get added to my paper planner, and then I can delete the email. Um, I'm able to bring my email box down to zero this year. It's my first time. It's a big accomplishment for me. And I was able to do that using Angela's tips. So I use the unroll.me to roll up the emails from different sites that I use. And then I have a to-do folder where I can save emails that I'm not ready to delete. I also have the different labels like others have mentioned to organize emails I need to save for a longer period of time. Uh, moving the emails into another folder and keeping that uh, zero has really helped me be more organized and feel less overwhelmed by the emails I get. And then once a week, I'll go through the to-do folders um, and see, ask myself, is, does an action need to happen this week or can I wait until next week? So is that purposeful or procrastination? And then this is a strategy that I actually heard from the Organized 365 podcast, which was a recommendation from our uh, group on Facebook. Um, and it's actually used with a paper folder, but I use it for both the paper and the email. So now if I can just apply all of these great strategies to my personal personal email, then I will be way more organized. <laughs> That's the trick. It sounds like you and I actually have some similarities in the way that we do things. Um, I also try to keep my inbox at zero, but it doesn't always happen. But um, I have a system that that makes it a quick fix for when it, when it doesn't happen. Um, so um, what I do is I just like... In with physical things, we want everything to have a place. I try to do the same thing digitally. Um, and so I have some folders that help me to manage that, um, some folders or some labels, depending on what email system you use. Um, first of all, as emails come in, um, the ones that are going to take two minutes or less, um, I do those. I, I just take care of those right away because I don't want to add those to a to-do list for later when I can just quickly take care of it right away. Um, so the the folders that I use um, are, I have them labeled, um, I put an at sign in front of them so they stay at the top of my list of all of my folders. Um, and I have immediate action, important action, incubation, print, someday, and waiting. And so um, what I do is if I have something that needs to be dealt with like that within the next couple of days, that will go in the immediate action folder. That's the one that, um, that I pay the most attention to. Um, and then 
the important action folder I use for things that they need to be done in the next week or two, but it's not quite as urgent. Um, the incubation folder I use for those things that I temporarily need to hold on to, but they they don't necessarily require action. So those things like, um, for instance, I just had a hotel reservation for a conference I'm going to. And so I just stuck that reservation into the incubation folder. Um, and then I just periodically go through it and delete what's already passed and no longer needed. Um, I use, um, the print folder, if that's something that's come through on my email that I want to print out, um, I'll just, I'll put it in there because sometimes, um, when I'm, checking my email, I'm not always in a position to be able to print. Um, and then the the someday folder I use for um, if it's some idea or something that I want to do someday in the future, but honestly, it can't even go on a project list right now, um, then I'll let it go in there. And I have very few things that I actually put in there, but at least they, they do have a spot when that happens. And then finally, the waiting folder I use, if I've emailed somebody and I'm waiting for a reply, um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I don't want to delete those emails because I want that, that trail. I want to be able to look back and see everything that I've written. And I also want to not forget in case they don't reply to me so that I can follow up. So I put those in the waiting folder if I'm waiting on somebody else. Um, and so then because I have those folders, I'm able to use the batching strategy, yay, <laughs> to, to get everything emptied out, um, and in a timely manner. And it lets me, lets me be a little more efficient, um, with my email. And then I also have more specific folders like parent communication, professional development. I have a full, uh, label for like website registrations, you know, what's my username and password, those sorts of things. So I'm hearing two sort of recurring themes through all of this. One is that you're turning off notifications for email and you're checking it when it's convenient for you, as opposed to whenever just checking them one by one as they come in. So that's really awesome that each of you really have these set times that you're checking your email. And the other thing that I'm noticing um, in terms of patterns is having a really streamlined system for your folders. I feel like a lot of people kind of overthink email folders or they treat them like paper folders. You know, if you have a file cabinet, it's better to have more folders because it's easier to get to what you're looking for. But with email, it's better to have fewer folders because you have a search function. There's really no reason to have, you know, 50, you know, some people even have more than that <laughs> folders that are, you know, super detailed because what happens is you end up spending all this time trying to figure out, okay, where should I put this now? You know, should it go under student or should it go under, you know, a colleague or w whatever it is? If there's too many different options, you'll find yourself sort of paralyzed and just letting things linger in your inbox because your filing system is so complicated <laughs> and you're not sure where to put them. So I really like this idea of having as few folders as possible and then use that search function if you need to go back in and dig something up. So um, those are really, really great tips. Let's move in now to um, some other strategies and tips and tech tools. I want to know what's something that you're using um, with technology that has saved you a lot of time as a teacher? Uh, I would have to say that my absolute favorite, favorite tech tool that continues to save me loads of time is Blooms. Um, and I've been using it for the last three years or so. It's simply the best communication tool that I've um, found in terms of engaging my parents 100% of the time. Um, and really, that's the biggest difference that I've noticed um, between when I used to have a class website, parents would often forget to check there for information. And so I'd get repeated uh, questions over and over again via email. Um, and because they were sending them directly to me and I had to respond to individual parents, the, the entire class would miss um, an opportunity to see those answers. Um, so what's great about Blooms is that I can send quick updates daily if I want to, or every other day, or even once a week. Um, I decide how often I can, I can um, send them information. Usually it's photographs of activities that we're doing in the classroom um, and videos. But there's also a student timeline function which um, works as a portfolio function. Uh, and this is something I use to share individual student work with parents. Um, another great aspect of Blooms is that I can schedule field trips and ask for chaperones to attend. And, um, you know, if I need three chaperones, I'll just put the number three and parents signed up all on their own. So it's really kind of a, a really simplified way 
of interacting with parents. And um, I found that, you know, as a lower elementary teacher, this really helps to reduce the anxiety when parents say, oh, I don't know what's happening in the classroom. Well, there's photographic evidence of what's happening in the classroom. They can't forget uh, events that are coming up because the calendar sends them reminders. Um, and it takes all the work away from me having to send out um, email reminders to parents uh, just because everything's integrated um, into uh, this app. So I highly recommend it. I'm going to say a big amen to everything that Osa just said. That I, Blooms definitely would be my number one time-saving tool. But my, um, I'll share with you kind of my runner-up. Um, so I really enjoy... Uh, Nearpod. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Nearpod, um, Nearpod is a website where it basically takes PowerPoints to the next level, allows them to be interactive. Um, I have one to one technology in my classroom. So um, students each see the screen, um, this individually on their on their individual Chromebooks as we as we work through it. Um, it pushes it out to them. And then I'm the one in control of as we move along. Um, one of the things that I love about Nearpod that, that saves me time is, first of all, there's a lot of pre-made lessons that other people have already made. So um, when I need to teach something on a specific subject, um, I can go in there and I can search and um, find some lessons that that match my needs. And, and you can edit those lessons. So even if it's not exactly what I need, I can change it to fit my needs. And that saves me time versus creating something from scratch. Um, and another thing that I love about it is that it um, can be a great formative assessment tool as well. It has a lot of interactive ability. Um, you can incorporate into the into the slideshow. You can incorporate videos and polls. You can ask specific questions. And when you do on you, the teacher screen, you see everybody's answers. So you can see what everybody's answering, and you can anonymously share some of their answers back out to use as a discussion. Um, you can quiz students. You, students can even. Um, create drawings to express their ideas. Um, there's also a bulletin board um, option for they can they can pin up a thought about a question that you ask, and so then everyone can see each other's. So um, I feel like that's a tool that's that's really helped me, especially in some of those. Um, like science and social studies, those things that in elementary school are really prep intensive and take a lot of time. Um, that's been a time saver for me. Um, for me, the uh, the program Jupiter Grades has been um, has been really vital towards uh, saving time and organizing my life. Um, it was discovered by an English teacher on our freshman team about ten years ago, and she started to show it to other other colleagues, and it basically sp spread like wildfire fly, uh, wildfire through our school. Um, we had a great principal who immediately saw the value in the program and the vision to see the value of teacher input, and basically bought us a school-wide license. And it's consistently and constantly upgraded. It's fluid. It's intuitive. You, it's a grading program, but it also um, allows me with the push of a couple buttons to contact all of the parents in you know, my sophomore classes or just one class or just one student. It keeps the log of all the messages that I've done. Um, it allows me to send not only email, but also text messages because that is their world, and that is how I reach them. Um, and then there's an ass assessment assignment component within it called Juno that um, allows you to make your own multiple choice, short answer, paragraph answer, um, quizzes, tests, form formative assessments. And you can either set it so that the answers are um, in, a, in a test format so that they don't see um, what the right answer is until they've completed the test. Um, you can, I put together what we call pre-quizzes, um, which basically will take a similar bank of questions, not the exact questions that kids will get on material. And it basically gives them feedback right away as to whether the answers they've selected are right or wrong. And when they miss one on the first try, it shuffles um, that same question back into the deck. And then when I'm done, um, all I really have to do is look and see, did they complete it? I'm not even grading it. And it also does analytics. Um, the it, it allows me to either cert grade questions electronically by um, student or um, my favorite is, of course, batching. So I can do it by kid. 
It allows me to write in um, or paste in really quick comments. Um, and that's done. The default is to blind. So I don't see who the kids are. If I want to check and say what, you know, who wrote that answer, I have to click on something. But it's really wonderful um, because it kind of, you know, you see what these kids have written and you, you have all these preconceived notions. Mm-hmm. And when you're grading, it's, you know, it's all sort of taken away and it's just sort of what's there. So I highly, highly recommend this program. For me, using Google Classroom is my number one tool. Um, all It's my portal. So all other sites, resources, assignments that I give the students are pushed through the Google Classroom. And the reason I like it is because I can quickly see who has completed an assignment, who's falling behind. I can see their work um, as they're working on it. And I also like the ability to provide them feedback and return it for improvements and then having the grading all in one place. So those are all um, ways that it helps me be more efficient. Wow, I'm getting so many great ideas listening to you all talk. Um, So I think I'm going to talk more about a strategy than a tool in particular. Um, Our school uses um, the Google Apps for Education suite. And then we also, um, we just adopted Schoology a few years ago for our LMS. Um, And when we did that, one of the big shifts that I noticed that was a strategy or mindset shift to me, um, excuse me, was this idea of, Um, thinking not just about what I need in the present, but what will help set me up for success in the future. So I'm constantly trying to find this balance between um, allowing my teaching practices to evolve and follow, um, you know, new ideas and research that's out there, but also, and and to be uh, reactive to what students I have and what their needs are and their interests, um, but to also not try and reinvent the wheel or come up with new things that are just new for the sake of being new. Um, And so using things in Google folders, in archiving things in Schoology, um, setting up folders that I can just then copy and paste into the same prep next year in Schoology, um, I found that has been really helpful just, again, in terms of a mindset shift um, to, to really be thinking about Um, how I can set things up so that next year, if I do this unit or I do this lesson, how will it be that much faster or easier to throw things together, even if there are some tweaks I want to make in the assessment or or how the instructions played out or some errors that I need to fix or, um, you know, current event tie-ins I need to update. I found it really saves me a lot of time when I approach unit and lesson planning with that mindset. Uh, And then the other strategy that I would say has been a big sanity saver for, for for me, um, I think education is putting a big push, um, and I would guess this would be not just my district, but um, big push on technology and trying all these new things. And it's so easy to get sucked into all the bells and whistles. Um, and and again, I'm a minimalist, so I really take on the the mantra "less is more." Um, and so. I do have a few key apps and tools and methods that work really well in harmony with how I teach. Um, and I stick to those and, and to add something else into the mix, I have to be pretty strongly convinced that this will have huge benefits for my students. Um, so I'm constantly questioning where does the technology add value to my goals to create better readers, communicators, and critical thinkers. Um, where is it a distraction? Where is it necessary in order to help my students learn to navigate our technological society um, as adults? Uh, Where is it important to break away to model that balanced living? Um, So those are the questions that I'm always mulling over. Um, And it's actually freed me up to say no to experimenting with a lot of, uh, you know, albeit neat tech tools. Um, Ultimately, they would have taken away some precious time from planning some really deep uh, instruction or that time I get to spend one-on-one with the students for the extra help, whether it's during my prep period or after school. So that really helps to, to focus um, my, my technology use, but also my time at school. Thank you for sharing that um, piece about really focusing on what's, what's most beneficial for students and not just trying out new tools just for the sake of trying something new. I think that all of us feel Um, like there's just so many different tools out there, you can't possibly have time for them all. And it really isn't necessary to use them all you have to, as you said, be 
you know, really convinced that something is going to have a benefit for your students in order to incorporate it? Is there a need? Is there a, is there something in your instruction or in students learning that isn't going as smoothly as you'd like? And if so, then maybe a tech tool can help with that. But we don't need to just add things in for the sake of adding them. So um, I love that you brought up that point. So I'll summarize there um, the the strategies, tips, and tech tools that have saved you all tons of time. Osa said Blooms. Nicole said Blooms. And Nearpod is her second runner-up. Uh, Kevin mentioned Jupiter Grains. Desiree mentioned Google Classroom. And Aaron talked about um, Schoology as well as um, Google Apps. So let's close off by talking about a strategy tip or tech tool that saved you time in your non-teaching life. So I actually use a very similar system um, in my non-teaching life as I do in my classroom. In fact, my system with my the folders of immediate action and important action and all that, that started as a home thing and then I transferred that to the classroom. Um, so I use that for both digital and physical um, physical things at home as well to help keep things streamlined. streamlined. Um the other thing that I use that's really helpful is an app called Cozy. So I have five children. Um, my husband also works full time. Um, and so, you know, like most of you, we're just busy and crazy. And so um, the app Cozy um, lets us, it's C-O-Z-I, um, it lets us have a joint calendar kind of similar to Google calendars with the color coding and things like that. Um, and it, But it also incorporates um, our shopping lists and our to-do lists so that we can have one place for everything. And that definitely saves me time at home. So um, my strategy isn't a tech tool. Um, what I found this year um, was that I really needed <clears throat> a way to sort of come down from uh, spending so much time staring at a screen because I felt like I was always trying to keep, you know, 10 balls in the air. Um, and I wanted to find a way um, that would help with me not having to switch between my teacher planner and my personal agenda. So this year I've uh, transitioned to using a bullet journal and it's been really, really wonderful um, for me, uh, because I love writing. And so this is a really good excuse to pretend I'm writing. Um, <laughs> and, and what I use it for is to sort of, I, I create a format for my, um, my professional, um, uh, calendar as well as my personal calendar. So I have it all in one place and, um, it's a really good way of tracking everything that I need to do all on the same page um, and then sort of using everything I've learned from the club to sort of try to get main things done um, um, and put, making a visual that doesn't cause me stress. So um, I think the best thing about it is that you can make of it what you want. Uh, you can format it however you want. I have sections for my teaching schedule. Um, I have sections for anecdotal records in the classroom, collecting teaching ideas um, or personal projects. Uh, I have a section for a to-do list, a spending log, a grocery list, sightseeing, anything I want is pretty much what I can put in it. Um, and um, yeah, the fact that I no longer have separate agendas now or um, digital lists, which I used to keep on my email, the fact that I have this one physical thing, I think is very calming for me because I do spend a lot of time staring at the computer and I, this new process now is something that um, uh, makes me feel you know, much calmer at the end of the day. Uh, two of the things that I love are emails and the Walmart grocery pickup. So together, these two things have saved me a ton of time. I can find meals through all recipes and saved websites, but um, I love the convenience of emails and how they put together a meal plan based on a topic that I've chosen, such as if I want to focus on being healthy or budget-friendly meals. Um, and then usually there's so, so many meals in there, it feeds us for over a week, so I don't have to pick all of them. And then I was already pairing their recipes with the grocery pickup through Walmart, which is free. But now they've um, recently linked together, so it's even easier. Uh, I have a toddler and a baby on the way, so this is all especially helpful during this crazy, crazy stage of life. Um, and then actually I moved all of my long-term lists, both personal and well related to Google Keep. That's um, one app as well that um, has helped me be organized in my personal 
I just discovered Google Keep this month myself, and I'm a little bit obsessed. Um, so I, at this point, I really feel like I deserve a commission from Google for all the plugging I'm doing. Um, but again, I stick with uh, just a few key apps. So um, like Desiree said, my um, my best, I think, success I've had in terms of the club uh, encouraging me to, to try tackling a project has been around meal planning. Um, so we keep our family calendar on Google Calendar, uh, very similar to Cozy. Um, so everyone has their own color code. Um, and we even have one for the family as a whole. And then I can just quickly see who's doing what uh, and, and what needs to be planned. And then in a folder in my home Google Drive account um, for meal planning, I have one document that has I just sat down one day with my cookbooks and I just like content dump a huge list of what are all our favorite dinners what are the meals that we eat regularly what are the meals the kids like I have two small kids at home so that often ends up being a short list but um, so I did that and then I have a meal uh, or a, excuse me a second document for lunch ideas for the kids so what are all the different things that they're eating right now um, and then I go in seasonally and I update that based on what produce is fresh uh, in season or, you know, the, the kids taste change. Um, and then I also have a Google document that has a blank calendar template. So every month I sit down and I print out the calendar template and I pull up the Google calendar and I look at what our schedule is like and I just start plugging in from that master list of dinners what we're going to eat for the month. Um, so it takes me, now that I have those lists collected, it takes me um, not that much time every month to just sit down on a Saturday and plug all that in. All right, we're going to be busy. Let's do takeout this night, uh, crock pot meal. We can do this on a Saturday when we're home and we can throw it in. Um, uh, it's going to be cold this week. Let's pick some soups. Um, and so it just, it makes it so much easier week to week when I go to write the grocery list to just see, okay, what are the recipes? Um, what do we need for ingredients? Um, and I find we make so many decisions as educators educators to have um, to go into a month and have my dinners planned. I know what I'm packing for me and the kids week to week. Uh, and then Sunday throwing the lunches together, uh, for the week and cutting up vegetables and, um, bagging things. It just, it makes things so much easier and it's, it's one less decision to make. Um, and so that's just a huge stress relief for me to have something be automated, um, for, you know, at least three out of the four weeks of the, the month. Um, my stuff is my strategy is basically using June, July, and August, uh, like they're your best friends. Um, I, my content partner and I, uh, make a to-do list in late May and early June. And we both like doing it then because all of our mistakes, wounds, scars are still fresh. So we have a much better sense of what we need to do differently or to get rid of, um, I don't go into school a ton in the summer. I still use the weekly list, um, but I will pick a rainy day in July to purge files and mess around with the layout of the room. Um, but almost all of my major changes to instruction or assessment are made in the summer. And, you know, we have this really rare opportunity to reflect and prepare um, that most working people don't get. So the more, you know, the more sort of thought and time you put into the summer I find it really takes the edge off of the crazy nine months when, you know, the roller coaster ride steps starts in September and we don't get off the ride until in my state, June. So um, those are some of the things that, that I, I look at. The other thing is um, I'd like to have basically during the school year, I have a, a bag of workout clothes packed in my car um, so I can go straight to the YMCA right after school. So that, helps manage my stress. Or if I'm going to yoga, my yoga clothes are there. Um, and I, the weekly pr planner is important for, um, you know, scheduling your life, but it's also really important to focus in on planning fun things. Um, we have a tendency to sort of um, focus in on only the things that we sort of have to do. And um, I was golfing with an older gentleman about 10 years ago, and he told me that one of the things that he does in retirement is he schedules the fun things first. And he said, I don't know if you noticed this, but old people tend to fetishize their chores. And um, it really made a, an impression on me. 
um, especially the word fetishize. And I think we do. I think we have a tendency to sort of put the chores first. Um, and that's not the way um, that we really should plan. And the point should be to do the things that we try to find time to do the things that we really like. Um, so um, when I used that bit of advice and I had a law professor who always used to say, work hard, but play harder. So I try to stick to that. A big thanks to these five graduates of the 40-Hour Teacher Workweek Club for sharing some of their best tips for digital organization and saving time with tech. If you want to participate in conversations like these and share productivity strategies with other teachers, get on the wait list for the club, and I'll send you a notification as soon as new members are able to join this summer. Just go to 40htw.com, 40htw.com. Your takeaway truth for the week ahead is from Nobel Peace Prize winner Christian L. Lange. He said, technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. I hope that the strategies shared today will help you use tech tools to simplify your life and get organized so that you can have more time for the things that really matter to you. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. Want more than just a weekly podcast episode from me? I'd love to also send you a weekly message of encouragement via email. I'll reach out each Sunday evening with a short message that's designed to help you feel more prepared and inspired and motivated for the week ahead. It's not a newsletter or a bunch of announcements. This goes out to over 85,000 educators. So I put just as much thought into crafting this weekly written message to my email list as I do into crafting my podcast episodes. And it's entirely unique content that you won't find anywhere else online. Just go to the cornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe and you can sign up. That's the cornerstoneforteachers.com slash subscribe.